<coughs> I would like to invite you all very much to this seminar. My name is Mats Hellström and I'm <coughs> chairman of Norden International who organizes this seminar <coughs> in courtesy of the European Commission and also the European Parliament. We are now, of course, in Europa Huset for those of you who are <coughs> listening in from other parts of the world. Well, very much welcome those who are present here and those who are listening to us in other spheres. The seminar is called In Remembrance of the Holocaust, The Search for Truth and What Follows. And this is, of course, a seminar being held during the Holocaust week. The discussion will be started here with <coughs> Julie Lindahl and Inga-Britt Alenius around Julie's book, The Pendulum, A Granddaughter's Search for Her Family's Forbidden Nazi Past. Julie Lindahl is an author, educator, and activist living in Sweden. Her <coughs> memoir from 2018, The Pendulum in Swedish, Pendeln, Nordstedt 2019, it reveals her six-year journey through Europe and Latin America to discover the role her <laughs> Hello. <laughs> played <coughs> in the Third Reich of the Nazis. She speaks widely in Sweden and beyond and has been engaged in projects to counteract violent extremism. She is the founder of Stories for Society, a Swedish non-profit dedicated to renewing the art of storytelling for social transformation. The moderator is Inga Britalenius, very well known in Sweden as a very active Swedish auditor, but also public servant in different areas, finance ministry for example, and she has been also the Under Secretary General for the United Nations Office of Internal Oversight Services. And later, <coughs> we'll hear from Brussels, Ingrid Belander Todino, and she's the head of unit in the European Commission for fundamental rights policies. And she will come in a little later than <coughs> on the screen here to discuss what has been said by Julie and Inga Britt. And of course, the role the European Commission plays when it comes to fundamental rights. Around, um, let's say, in an hour or so, we will then have questions and answers from all of you who are here, and of course also those who could participate in another way. And around 12 o'clock, we will then have something to eat, sandwiches, tea, coffee, buns, etc. Here in, in the, this house, in Europa Huset. And, and I will again thank you very much, the Commission, and Erik von Pistorkors, who is the head of the European Commission. And it's because of the courtesy of you and your colleagues in the European Commission that we are here and so much help from you also. Perhaps you would like to say a few words before we start, or? Thank you, Mats. Um, good morning, everybody. I should be very brief. Um, it's uh, important for us, uh, as the Commission uh, of uh, Representation in Sweden, to be able to host this event today. Uh, I think it's worth recalling uh, every opportunity that uh, the European Union was created in the ashes of the Second World War, uh, and this is uh, all the more important in such a week as this. But, but I won't take any more time. This, uh, we, we wait for the, uh, for, the, for the event to start, but thank you, Mats. So thank you, Eric. And now <coughs> I will then give the floor to the moderator, Inga Britt Alenius, please. Thank you. Well, I will be short. I will just introduce Judith because she, we are starting this seminar by 
Julie presenting her book. So please, Julie. Right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let's see here. I'll just adjust myself a little. Um, some of you might be familiar with the English, the cover of the English version of the book. I put up the cover of the Swedish version here uh, to kick off my presentation for anyone who's wondering if it's available in Swedish. Um, it's called The Pendulum uh, in English. And um, I'll be doing a rather short presentation uh, of my journey and really the material that's a story that is in the book. Um, no more than about 15 minutes, and then we'll get into some, I can reveal more about it during the discussion, hopefully. Um, so, let's get right into where, in a way, the end of the story. I want to begin at the end, in a way. Um, this is the Charles Tellier, uh, it was a ship that uh, bore passengers from Hamburg in December 1960 to Sao Paulo in Brazil. And um, there's nothing particularly unusual about this. Uh, those ships went all the time. There were a lot of Germans living in Brazil um, ever since the end of the 19th century, actually. Um, so... Um, on the ship, though, there were Jews. I've seen the passenger uh, list for this, this particular journey. There were Jews who no longer wished to live in Europe, who um, probably could no longer live with the idea of the perpetrators, most of whom were still running free in the Federal Republic of Germany, um, and lived... Uh, fairly good lives. Um, they just didn't feel that um, Europe was any longer a place for them and sought a new life free from those daily threats around them as they saw it uh, to move to Brazil. Um, there was a, a, a new wave of war crimes trials that had started from around 1958 uh, in Germany when uh, Germans set up their own prosecutor's office, or West Germans, rather, set up their own prosecutor's office and began prosecuting their own citizens. Uh, but even this did not really um, give many Jews who were still uh, living in Europe that much comfort because, in the end, not that many of them were brought to justice. Um, there, was, there were, though, others on this ship, and uh, among them, there was a former SS couple. They were my grandparents. Um, they also no longer felt comfortable in their beloved fatherland uh, for precisely the reasons that I have just named. That is to say that uh, Germans had started, or West Germans had started, to try their own citizens, and they had set up a prosecutor's office. The first major public case, which was all over the papers, uh, came in 1958, and then, um, as we know, uh, the trials opened out in 1960, the Auschwitz trials, and uh, then Adolf Eichmann was captured in Buenos Aires, and um, it became clear that a trial was going to be held during the following year, that is to say, in the spring of 1961, and um, I suspect, in fact, I have quite a bit of confirmation that um, this unsettled my grandfather quite a lot. Um, the capture of Eichmann really did, and, and really the prospect of a trial, sent shockwaves among SS circles because they wondered who was going to be named in the trials. Eichmann had a very wide network, and anyone who he had, you know, even if you didn't know the guy, if you had in some way brushed past with anything that he did, um, you could be, get into very big trouble. Uh, so, um, people like my, my grandfather, uh, old comrades, felt uncomfortable and suddenly began to make themselves invisible 
uh, disappeared to places in the Middle East, and to Brazil, which was still known as a country that was a safe haven for former SS. Um, uh, you can wonder why Eichmann was captured in Argentina, but Brazil is a very big country, and uh, um, so far uh, no one had been extradited, and um, uh, SS felt, or former Nazis anyway, felt fairly safe there. I wonder what this journey must have been like uh, for those on board, especially for the Jews on board, because um, I think it was fairly obvious among themselves who was who. Um, it must have been uh, a terrifying journey. Um, my 20-year-old mother, um, who had been born in occupied Poland in 1941, followed uh, one year later on a different ship, uh, same route, um, from the same port. She had been forced to leave her university studies in Freiburg because her father wanted to have his children work the land on a facenda, so a large estate in the interior of Brazil that he had managed to acquire. Um, so deep sympathy for her, even though she and I did not enjoy a good relationship uh, in our lives. Um, I was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1967, and no one in my family would ever divulge to me the real reason for my mother's family's presence in Brazil. So I guess you know who this is. Same haircut. Um, so this in itself would not be a problem, I mean, that people didn't talk about the past. Uh, I think we, we live in a time when you're supposed to let it all hang out and, and talk through things publicly and, and so forth. And I fully understand uh, that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a problem that people prefer not to speak about a painful past, except that... Um, it might affect their children uh, if it goes, if it affects their children, and if it's something that is very heavy and very serious, um, it always does. It goes into the family, uh, and it becomes a problem. I, I work with a lot of Holocaust survivors, or have worked with a lot of Holocaust survivors and their descendants, and they attest to similar effects, that there is silence, no one speaks, uh, and there are communication issues uh, that come up because of this. So anyway, this is me in my two, as a two-year-old in Sao Paulo in German folk dress at Dirndl, which I always seem to be wearing when my German grandparents came to visit us from the interior of Brazil. And I had several of these dresses, which I found extremely itchy and hot, and was constantly trying to tear off myself against my mother's wishes. And you can ask yourself, why did my mother dress me in these things all the time? Uh, or at least when her parents came to visit. And I think it's fairly clear that, it's clear to me anyway, that she wanted to, she had married an, an American banker, and yet she wanted to reassure her um, her, 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 her parents that she had not um, forgotten her roots. Uh, I guess it was messaging that she had not forgotten their way. And um, I think she had a great deal of difficulty in uh, navigating uh, what her parents had done, because I, think, I don't think she knew exactly what they had done, but I think that she was aware that they had been in the SS, as, as all the children were. Um, so, um, um, you could say that, um, although I had no idea about the history, obviously, of my family at this age and uh, in my early childhood, um, uh, I went, went around dressed in it. And um, it's a very odd thing to, in a way, uh, figuratively be, or, or symbolically be dressed in history, but uh, as you grow older and become more aware, not to be allowed to ask any questions about it. Uh, and um, from when, I was, when I was younger, uh, of course, before I could even formulate the questions, um, I felt, uh, I sensed, and young children do, of course, the frustration and anger uh, 
that surrounded this um, inability to speak about what was nevertheless something that certainly affected the lives of my parents. So the existence of someone like my grandfather in the family while they were living in Brazil and had a reputation to uphold posed a problem and an issue. Uh, so especially when at some point he got into the newspapers, but I, I won't get into that right now. Um, so um, I, I did sense it uh, a lot through, especially through through parents' behavior. Um, now I we left Brazil when I was just short of four years of age, uh, and my grandfather died there, and I was supposed to forget about all that. And we went on to live in ten different countries on three continents, mostly in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and um, this constant uprooting um, meant that it was barely possible to find one's bearings, let alone consider our origins or, or try to come to terms with it. We were just constantly packing our things and moving to the next country and adjusting to life there. So it, it was very disorienting, uh, but there was this sort of past there that, that we just um, kind of skated over and, and were supposed to ignore. Um, but there was this constant growing inability to discuss things in the family. Uh, we became more and more and more distant, and it seemed like there was just nothing that anyone could do about it. So, this is a picture of my, my grandparents in the 30s uh, in northern Germany, where they come from. Uh, the picture reminds me that people are not evil, um, and that it behooves us to know them. Uh, their deeds can be evil but I think labeling people as evil kind of gets in the way of us trying to figure out why they do certain things. Um, when I was at Oxford uh, in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, and also even before that when I was doing a Fulbright scholarship uh, in, in West Germany, I studied Polish-German relations during the 20th century. So. There are no coincidences, I suppose. Um, and I, I don't think I chose it that consciously. I was just drawn to the subject. Uh, my mother was born uh, in, in uh, present-day Poland. Um, I became, many, many, many questions came up. As we all know, the wall came down. Uh, the history of Eastern Europe started to uh, open up for people, sources, information started to open up. That old history that had remained frozen during the Cold War started to become more accessible. You could go and talk to people, and so on. Uh, documentation, archives, and the works. Um, it occurred to me that Perhaps uh, when my father, who after all was an American and a good guy on the, and whose family had been on the right side of the war, when he was coming to visit me at Oxford that I could ask him uh, you know, what his father-in-law had got up to during the Second World War. And when he came to visit, I did just that. Uh, my father was a, a very sensitive person. He was a stable, a secure person. Um, and rarely expressed anger uh, or, or any, any extreme emotions of any kind. Uh, but um, his response to my question was to, to start shaking. His hands started to shake. And he forbade me from ever asking questions about this topic again. So what I did was, uh, I, had, I had written up an application to do a doctoral degree. Uh, and instead, I threw it in the garbage. I left Oxford and I promised myself I would never touch the subject. Um, at the same time, I continued to have meetings with my grandmother, who lived in southern Germany. Uh, she and I enjoyed uh, a very good relationship. We shared a lot of interests, literature, music, um, and, uh, and art. And um, um, she was, she also offered a lot of the affection I felt I missed in my relationship with my mother. Uh, and I, of course, didn't want to lose her affection. And uh, so therefore, when at times when she would launch into her views of handicapped people or East Europeans or the Holocaust, 
what she thought about that. Um, I felt uh, very, very uneasy, to say the least. Uh, there was a brutality about the way she discussed these things that was very hard to listen to. Uh, for any, anyone sitting here hearing it, you would immediately realize uh, what political persuasion she had been. Uh, but I, I didn't want to confront her at all uh, with this, and at some point she, she tried to convince me that the Holocaust had in fact never happened. It was a plot by the international media to keep Germans down. Uh, and what I did when she said this was, instead of saying, no, Grandma, it wasn't like that, I didn't want to oppose her, I went and did the dishes. And of course, in the, in the act of doing that, you suddenly start to realize what it's like to be a bystander because uh, what you're doing is exactly what Elie Wiesel uh, said one, uh, talked about once in a very famous quote in which he said to forget the dead would be akin to murdering them a second time. Uh, that's, what it, that's what that was, to go and do the dishes. Uh, so um, this was not a good situation, as you can imagine. Um, and the situation did not get better. Uh, I'm going to explain what this is, but I think you've worked out that it's uh, a description of the journey that I initiated in 2010, uh, which is the European part of my travels. Uh, there was also a Latin American portion, which we'll get into in a few moments. Um, my father's death in 2007 was a watershed, and it became very clear to me that um, I needed to do something about the situation. I needed to know, um, I, I can talk more precisely later on in our discussion about what that watershed was and what, what the content of that was, but um, I, I can say that um, there was, I was 43 years old at the time, um, I had over 20 years had gone by uh, since I had promised myself not to take up this matter, uh, but it was just impossible not to do it. Um, plus, I was also educated to do it, <laughs> um, which is usually the problem for most people, that they're not educated, they don't speak the language, and so on and so on. I had it all. I had no excuse whatsoever. Uh, so, um, but I think as you all know, the likelihood that I would find anything in the German Federal Archives, which is where I decided to start in Berlin, uh, was really quite small. Uh, the Nazis were great at destroying their own documents. The Allies were even better at destroying them because they bombed their cities. Um, and um, also, German federal, or West German federal, no, at that time, German federal law um, is uh, extremely strict when it comes to protecting private citizens. So, uh, strictly speaking, I wasn't supposed to receive any documents without consulting uh, the older members of my family. But the problem was the older members of my family would never consent to the release of anything. They didn't want to talk about it. I didn't know all these things. Uh, I just turned up at the archives and looked an archivist in the eye and said, I'm in trouble, I need to know something about this person. And I think I got very lucky in my search because time after time I kept meeting people who uh, weren't supposed to do something but would look me in the eye and say, I understand that you need help, uh, and they would help me. Uh, so, the, I guess there was a, a seriousness that people picked up. Um, there, was, there, was, uh, there were some people who tried to stop me from going. Actually, the last person who I met before going to the archives was a very dear friend of mine, a Jewish scholar, who um, already thought she knew uh, that I was going to find something very serious. She knew my family, uh, she knew me, she knew uh, all of my the issues that I had lived with, and she tried to stop me from going. In fact, she begged me not to go. And she had fled Germany during the 30s, so she had every reason to encourage me to go. But she thought that it would change my life forever, and she was absolutely right about that. Um, so at the Federal Archives, I was handed 100 pages, uh, which immediately confirmed that my uh, grandfather had joined the party in 1931, so before the takeover of power, which meant that he was most, well, I know that he was a 
convinced Nazi. He was uh, he, he wasn't somebody who sort of went along for practical reasons. Um, he joined the Mounted SS in 1934. Uh, and he was stationed in occupied Poland throughout the duration of the war. So from the fall of 39 uh, until, well, until January 1945, so slightly before the end of it. Uh, and um, all the place names were there of where they had been stationed. Um, there were photographs. Um, and still, what went through my mind was this cannot be right. This is not them. Uh, I am putting this away. This is, this is not... But then I saw some, um, some documents with my grandmother's handwriting on it. Now, throughout my life, I had uh, received things from my grandmother, um, birthday cards, you know, uh, letters. Uh, and, of course, when I saw the handwriting, which hadn't changed at all, I realized that it was them and that I could not dismiss this anymore. Um, and on my way out of the archives, um, I was completely confused and wondering, what on earth am I going to do? And the immediate, most immediate thing that came to me was, this is enough. You know enough. Put it down. Uh, you don't have to discuss this. You know what it is. Leave it. Forget it. Uh, but there was a journalist who I had met on the way in, who happened to be the last journalist, or the, a ger very famous German journalist. I just met her on the street. And uh, she was the last person to interview the surviving Nazis in Argentina. And um, uh, uh, so, and she was very involved in making the Eichmann files or the documents about Eichmann public. She sat there in the locker room. She, or, got two cups of coffee from the machine. She said, so what'd you find? And I said, I don't know, I have a hundred documents or a hundred pages, I don't know what to do with it. And she said, well, listen here, you have um, a duty. You cannot just leave this behind. You have to go after it. You have to find out what it means. And I said, how am I gonna do that? And she said, well, you're educated to do it and I'll help you, so get going. So I ended up uh, going to various archives in Germany and Poland, mostly West Central Poland. Uh, and uh, I ended up also meeting, to my great shock and surprise, quite a number of eyewitnesses. And I'll, I'll quickly reveal what the content of those meetings was in a moment. Um, but um, it ended up taking me four years because the paper trail was very, very long. The documents I had received in Berlin were just, just one pebble. Um, so, this is a, a picture of a normal day of, at work for my grandfather. He's the man over there. Uh, there's two SS people in the picture, and those are forced laborers over there. Um, what did I find out about my grandfather uh, in all this, in this search? Well, briefly, he was um, appointed as a special fear for landed domains in East Prussia and Poland. And his task with others was to transform uh, Poland into the breadbasket of the Third Reich. Uh, Hitler was very concerned about keeping up support for his war, and he had to feed his people, and he had to feed his troops. Uh, so this was uh, an important task, uh, the management of very large estates. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, was not to remain in Poland. The ultimate goal was to get to Ukraine. This was uh, what the Nazis were after. Um, you know, Putin shares their enthusiasm for Ukraine. Um, and um, um, my grandfather constantly lamented after the war that they never got to Ukraine because, of course, the soil is very rich in Ukraine. Uh, so... Um, but there was another task that, that, that my grandfather was charged with, um, aside from making the land productive, and it was contradictory to his, his, his first mission. So the, the second mission was to wage a racial war. And, um, of course, it contradicts making the land productive if you are beating and torturing uh, people who are working the land, uh, which is exactly what happened. Uh, and um, he was known as a fanatic, um, and his mission actually made him... Uh, there we go. Um, his mission associated him, or, or made him, um, 
uh, suspected of deportation and murder of the existing landowners. This is a picture of my grandparents in the occupied territories. And um, during my journey, I began to wonder how many lives had to be extinguished for, for them to experience this moment. Um, my grandmother always called it a beautiful life. She told me that I could not understand what a beautiful life it was. So, um, just a, a brief description of my meetings with the eyewitnesses and, and just to give another pers perspective on what kind of life it was. Um, I managed to, with the help of a, of a very uh, dynamic, energetic, young Polish historian who I met at the archives in Poznan, uh, I managed to meet five different families uh, and um, persons who had one way or another uh, had their lives deeply affected by what my, uh, what my grandfather did. Um, some people didn't want to shake my hand, some people were very angry at me, um, and I could understand that because I could take it. It didn't, I won't say it didn't bother me, but, but I understood them. Uh, probably, these were poor people out on the, the Polish countryside. No one had listened to them. Uh, they'd probably been through hell afterwards uh, <laughs> with, with the Soviets coming in and taking over. Um, they hadn't had a wonderful life. Um, but there was one man um, who I met who was extremely welcoming uh, with his uh, wife and, and a grown daughter who welcomed me into his home and um, uh, sat for several hours and shared with me what he remembered. He was a boy uh, who had been worked as forced labor with his parents on one of my grandfather's estates. And uh, at some point when... Uh, my grandfather had walked past him. This young boy had forgotten to doff his cap, as all Polish males were required to do when the SS passed by. And my granddad had hit him across the head, which left him with a scar that was still visible. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine that I felt extremely bad and began to feel quite guilty, even though I can't say that guilt was my point of departure uh, for this journey. Uh, it was a much more selfish reason that I went on this journey, was to take care of my own shame and curiosity and, and, and whatnot, and try to help my family in a way. Um, but um, when I saw this, and I sat with this man and listened to him, there was this desire to beg for forgiveness, so I was on my way to falling onto my knees, um, and he instead held me up by the arms, and he shook me around, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, you didn't do anything, it wasn't your fault. Uh, so let's go outside and look at all the beauty there is in the world together. He had a lovely garden full of a ch with, a, with a cherry orchard in it, and um, I would say that this was a very, very important moment for me, a personal transformation. Uh, where this shame that I had been carried or carrying around turned to a sense of responsibility. Um, if he could do it, I could do it. This is, my, this is a photograph of my grandmother, um, which I found in the archives, but she also proudly showed it to me in her first uh, driver's license, uh, which she got when my grandfather went to war in the autumn of 1939. She joined various Nazi women's organizations, welfare organizations, which had uh, the primary uh, uh, mission of um, encouraging so-called Aryan women to have as many children as possible, but also to raise them uh, for the struggle, uh, the so-called struggle. And um, I have actually produced a new manuscript which is, explores this business of um, child-rearing practices, uh, women and children in the Reich, and how these child-rearing practices, which were widespread in the form of a book written by a certain person, uh, which, which actually uh, modern psychological research has shown, has affected several generations. Um, so my grandmother was both a victim of a culture that encouraged male violence uh, and overlordship, but she was also a, clearly a perpetrator. Um, and um, 
I did share my findings with her when I, when I knew enough. Um, I decided that I didn't want to do to her what she had done to me, which was to lie. Uh, and um, because I had asked her if they were in the SS and she had told me that that was a bizarre idea and where had I come up with that and so on. Um, and and she, was, she was over 100 years old, but she was clear in her mind, otherwise I would not have done that. Uh, and I just felt that um, it, was, it wasn't right to just... Um, to not be honest. Um, but I decided I didn't have to drag her through every last detail. My idea was to sit next to her, be calm, hold her hand, not accuse her of anything, uh, and rather uh, try to come to some form of mutual recognition of what had taken place in our family. Uh, very sadly, she was not able to do, she wasn't able to come with me to that place. Uh, and instead denied everything and um, was, was really very, very angry with me afterwards. And, um, but, but in retrospect, um, I think that it was quite important to, to do it. Uh, my husband always said that you, did, you do that for yourself, for no one else. If you don't do it for yourself, you won't feel, you won't feel like you're being honest. Uh, and I'm glad I did. So, uh, I realize we have to move on, um, and I'm about nearing the end. This is an image of my uh, grandfather on his way out into the interior of Brazil, taking a so-called cafezinho, uh, uh, one of those little strong coffees Brazilians drink, uh, on his way out to the interior uh, somewhere during late 1961, or maybe autumn 1961. Um, he never had to consider the consequences of his actions uh, because he had come into an environment which appreciated former SS. Uh, the senator of the state he lived in was a friend of his. He was a man called Filinto Miller, who had once been invited to Germany during the late 30s by Heinrich Himmler to learn about the SS, but also how the Gestapo worked. And one of the reasons Brazil ended up with such a terrible record for torture by the police was because Filinto Miller um, retrained the police based on what he learned about the Gestapo's techniques. Uh, so, um, my, my grandfather was also very appreciated because, um, to be fair to him, he was also very skilled. He knew how to make land productive. Uh, and Brazil's economy was starting to grow very quickly at the time, and they needed skilled people, and that was one of the reasons they liked Germans, they didn't mind if they were former SS, that didn't bother them, and for some people it was in fact a plus. Brazil was far away from the atrocities of the Holocaust, uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't take in the moral and emotional weight of it, and I would say still have not. Uh, so, but grandfather didn't end, have a happy end, I would say. He died alone. His family left him in the interior. Um, I guess he was, became more and more worried about, because you know more and more perpetrators were, were being brought to justice and hunted out. Um, and, but the irony of his end was that um, after his family left him, the, the, the last person to care for him, who was his mistress, was somebody who was called a mulata, uh, that is somebody uh, who, had, um, who, was, who was mixed eth ethnic background and who had darker skin color. And, um, well, you can imagine, I wonder what his, how his ideology kind of went along with that, uh, that his mistress was a woman. Uh, who really didn't fit into the picture of what someone who's Aryan looks like. Uh, final uh, uh, slide here um, is about this journey in Paris, Parag uh, Brazil and Paraguay. Um, it came unexpectedly, my old college in the United States. I was about to end you know, my journey. Uh, I had written up my, my findings, mainly for myself, and a few teachers, maybe, who might be able to use it in, in, in the classroom. Um, and, um, but my old college, Wellesley College, uh, in the US said, no, no, you don't. You have to go finish your work. So they sent me a very generous budget, uh, which I was in disbelief that they, they did, was a fellowship. Uh, and I went to Latin America with the goal of figuring out what life was actually like for former SS. What did it look like? We know that many of them fled there, but we don't really know that much about 
what their lives looked like. Uh, well, who were their contacts? I mean, in my grandfather's case, it turned out that one of his, his key contact was someone who had, an SF, former SS, who had fled Europe in 1948. That's how they found their way. Um, I went to archives and, whoops, now what's happened to the screen here? Let's see. Well, you, you saw it. Uh, we won't bother about it. I went to archives uh, in the big cities. Um, I, I um, then went into the interior and actually sought out uh, their, 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 the place where they first fled to. The okay. I'll continue talking so we don't waste time. So I, I actually managed to get to the facenda where they first fled to, and it really confirmed my theory that they, they were fleeing something because even in 2016, it was nearly impossible to find. It was so buried away. Uh, and um, uh, I really, once I got there and stood there in this isolated place in which there was still no running water and still no electricity, I, um, <laughs> let, let, the okay, the okay, the okay, tuck. Um, so I, I really did understand my mother's frustration and anger that as a 20 year old you get dragged out to a place like that because uh, your father needs you to work the land. Um, dragged out of another life that you could have lived. Um, it was very clear to me. In Paraguay, um, I discovered a branch of the family I didn't know existed. Everyone had told me my uncle had been dead for 40 years, but he wasn't dead. He was alive and had a family in Paraguay. And since he was the oldest uh, of my um, uncles and aunts, he remembered the end of the occupation. He remembered um, a lot. Of, there were a lot of things he could tell me about um, my, my grandparents and their lives. And he was actually, although maybe his history wasn't all quite, quite, quite right and he'd been a little bit affected ideologically by his father, uh, he was very honest, he was very open, and he was very prepared to share. Um, so to, to, I'd like to end the presentation on um, the meeting with my cousins, um, because I think this is a positive note to end things on. Um, my Paraguayan cousins, uh, uh, two of them, uh, a man and a woman, approaching around their 30s, around 30 years of age, whom I had no idea about. We had never met each other, and suddenly we were standing in front of each other. Um, immediately, we understood each other. Uh, it was a very strange thing. Um, we didn't even speak one another's languages. Uh, well, we had a little bit of German in common. They could speak a bit of German. Um, well, they had always wondered about their father's family. He never spoke about his family. They had no contact with any family in Europe or anywhere else. Um, and they had had very troubled communications with their father in life. They had had very troubled relationship, just as I had had a troubled relationship. And as it turns out, my other cousins with their other parents had had very troubled relationships because all of us had suffered from the same thing, that we could not speak about something very important in our families. Now we can speak, and now we can talk to our children about it, and we don't have to have those things going on in a new generation. Thank you very much. We'll go back to the book cover as a background. So. Well, thank you, Julie. I've, I've read your book with uh, great interest, and I even with even more intensive interest listened to your expounding on this uh, journey or adventure to going into your past. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not uncommon nowadays for people to, to travel and to explore their past. It, people even send their DNA samples <laughs> for examination, yeah. and adopted children will uh, are eager to go back and to find their origin. Mm -hmm. Now I, I wonder, why did you pursue this journey and, and to go back in your past? What prompted you really to do it? Yeah, well, well, I mean, I think I've I've um, intimated about I've talked a bit about the communication problems and so on, um, but but what I I think I wanted to lift it up a level because we're we're here um, kindly invited to sit in the space of of, of the the um, EU representation here in Stockholm and um, you know. 
when history in a in a family is falsified, uh, of course it it affects the family one way or another, especially if it's a, a, a heavy, serious history. Um, but um, you can see the same pattern in in nations at a higher level, uh, and um, you know I think there's a there's a link where where we don't speak about uh, where, where we try to suppress information, where we try to um, twist information, where we tolerate tolerate outright lies. Um, it um, also perverts not only our families. It can go into our societies, perverts our societies as well. It makes our societies sick and it makes them aggressive. Uh, and I think that's what we see, for example, among other places in Russia today. It, this is a society in which uh, the past has been tampered with. Uh, people, I don't think Russians have had sufficient time with democracy to be able to learn themselves enough about their past. and. Uh, a leader with uh, a certain agenda has uh, filled their minds with, um, with, or at least filled filled the airwaves anyway, uh, with certain ideas which are false uh, about their history. And what is the result? War is the result. So that's kind of. I would say. I wouldn't say it was the. It became the motive over time for this journey because in the beginning it was all extremely personal. Uh, I mean, it was all getting rid of this shame and, and the poor communications in our family. And, you know, I loved my family. You know, I didn't want our relationships to deteriorate. Uh, also, I would say that um, there was, you know, I'm a mother. Uh, I have twins who are 24 years old now. Uh, at the time, they were young children. And... Um, I was quite frightened that um, I might repeat these old patterns of poor communication with my own children. Uh, I think it's uh, without deliberately wanting to do it, if you're raised that way, somehow it can become that way if you don't become conscious about it and try to change, change it in a very marked way. Um, and so I would say to people who, you know, there are some people, uh, certainly, especially my own family, who feel that I have betrayed my family, uh, that I, I, I uh, you know, but to me it is, to me it doesn't feel that way because, uh, not now, it doesn't feel that way because I didn't betray the family. I did something for my family. I'm doing something for my children who can now walk with you know, I don't want to say with their heads high, but they um, they don't have to go around with shame. They don't have to go around with bad communication. They don't have to go around with those things. But evidently, it wasn't satisfying for yourself to keep your finest for yourself. You did write a book. Why did you yeah. write the book? <laughs> yeah, you're very right. There are, very, there are two different issues to... to to find out things and then to actually write a book. And then there's a third stage, which is to publish the thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you can write something and put it in your drawer. Uh, so, and, and most of the stuff I write, I do put in my drawer, fortunately. Um, but but um, the writing was, is my way of sorting out everything. That's the way I am. Um, and I think editing, uh, so I, I work you heard from Mats that I have uh, founded a um, a um, nonprofit organization that works with the art of storytelling, and so I'm very in touch with the way that uh, storytelling through writing for me and editing. So editing what you have written, not just writing new things, but going back through it again and and thinking about whether this is actually you know, whether this is actually the way uh, you want to tell the story about things, because we can have the facts, but then there's always a way of telling the story. And I can definitely tell you that what's in there is not what was in my original manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an enormous amount of, of anger and upset and so on. But of course, you have to go through those things in order to, to get to a more um, mature approach uh, to portraying 
the story and, and what, what went on. Uh, so so I, I would say that um, that, was, that was one thing, that, that this editing process was something that was very, very important. Um, but then the business of seeking publication, well, that had a lot to do with world events. Uh, and... Um, and, and also things that I was doing with my nonprofit organization. Um, as we all know, um, forces started to emerge uh, that were authoritarian and, and anti-human rights. And, um, and they had been rising, rising, rising steadily all the time during the time that I was doing this research. Um, and I, um, I became more aware of that. Um, uh, especially on two occasions, uh, in, in around, this was around 2014. One occasion was when I was with my nonprofit in a classroom with a group of nine to ten year olds, and it's portrayed in the book. And, you know, this was out in the Swedish countryside, and we were doing an exercise of telling, telling a, creating a big story together, and the story involved a Muslim girl. And immediately they started drawing swastikas and uh, talking about Hitler being a great strong leader. And I thought, where has this come from? You know, we're, we're, I hadn't mentioned I had men mentioned Hitler. I hadn't mentioned. I mean, there was we weren't talking about Nazism. This was about something completely different. These were nine to ten year olds. And I thought I'm not going to get angry at them, because if I get angry at them, they'll just do it more later because that's the way it is with little kids. If you forbid something, then they just want it more. Uh, and and uh, I just took the pictures away, and I said, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Came back the next day, and for eight weeks, which was the time I was supposed to work with these children, we worked through, first of all, what these symbols and words meant. Uh, of course, I had to be careful, uh, because they were so young, so I had to be careful not to go into some very hard details. Um, but, but at the same time, we were able to weave a different story and get to a, a more compassionate place. Uh, that was one thing. The other event, which I, I think was very telling, was this was during election week, 2014, in Sweden. I was invited by a common friend of ours, Bo Ekman, to, to uh, co-host a, a discussion with many prominent people in Swedish society at Forum for Levande Historia, Forum for Living History, which, as you all know, is, is a place uh, charged with um, educating about the Holocaust and training teachers to educate about the Holocaust. And uh, I said to Bo, I don't think anyone's going to come to this event uh, because it's election week. All these people are out on the radio and television, and why will they come to this seminar? And he said, well, let's see what happens. Um, this name, the title of the seminar was Is Fascism on Its Way Back in Europe? And the room was full. And I was charged with asking the first question to the audience. And I looked at them and said, um, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Uh, and, and the answer was, we're here because this is the only place where the most important question of this election is being asked. And at that moment, when I received that answer, I thought, um, this work that I've done, this book, or whatever you want to call it, that I've written, manuscript, isn't mine anymore. It belongs to world history. And so I decided to seek publication. Another question, when I, when I uh, started reading your book, I had expect, expected a sort of research thesis. Mm. And what I find is a piece of literature. Mm. Why did you also choose to present your experience or research in that uh, literary form? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think some people, especially... Uh, well, there are some historians who quite like it, but um, some people can be frustrated by it because they, they feel that it should just be a, a fact book. You know, you should, you mm. should just get the facts out. And, and, um, and, the, and there are various... I would say that there are various reasons for that. Um, one is that I don't think anyone can really imagine the sort of constraints you're working under uh, when, uh, when you are a person in, in, living in a family in which many people who are in the store are actually alive. 
Um, not everyone, but but not not the two most important protagonists. They they aren't alive. They weren't alive. But but there were other people who were still alive, uh, and not wanting to hurt people. Uh, uh, of course, it's impossible not to hurt people in your family by writing a story like this, but not to, at least to um, write in a way that is, is shows that you have tried to give everyone a chance. You have shown empathy and compassion for, for all people uh, who you are writing about. That doesn't mean you have to love everyone you're writing about, but you have to have tried to, see, you have to try to see them. And... Um, you know, releasing everyone's names and every last detail in that context is 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 not possible. Uh, it it is uh, actually I I um, uh, the, the one of the people I went to see uh, when I was thinking about uh, publication was a, a dear friend of mine who be, had become the head of the British Academy uh, in the UK. So he was the UK's highest ranking historian, as it were. He had been my professor. And I said to him, I've done this journey. I have all this stuff. How do you think I should write it? And he said, well, write a history, good for, book, for God's sakes, Julie. Uh, footnotes and all. And I, and I said, okay, well, and I went back and I was going to do that. Of course I can do that. Uh, but then I thought, this was the other factor, uh, was that um, I thought, who's going to read this book? Um, there are so many fine history books and finely written history books that are read by too few people. Uh, and uh, what I wanted, I know how to tell a story. I'm a good storyteller. And I thought, I want lots of people to read this, not only the first chapter or the second chapter, I want them to get to the end. Uh, and one way to do that is to tell a really good story and make it accessible to people. Uh, and, and so I chose my own way. I didn't, you know, I chose my own way. Just one other thing to add about the constraints, which I have just remembered, is that um, I want to go back to the constraints that uh, the German Federal Archives poses, because, uh, you know, I was able, was allowed to have these documents, but I was not allowed to share them with anyone. Uh, and so, I haven't shared them with anyone. But if I had written a fact book and I had, had uh, put all sorts of footnotes, I would have had to share the document. And that just wasn't possible. So this was a way for me to, to do this, working under all the constraints I was under. So. I see. I think you haven't um, showed us one thing. You haven't explained the pendulum. Oh. Would you like to do that? Yeah, what a good idea. I, think I see it in your book. <laughs> you've, you've seen it in my book, and I have the pendulum with me. Thank you for asking that question. Um, here's the pendulum. It's, what, it's something I got from my grandmother. It's a metal object on the end of a, hanging on the end of a silk string. And um, she used to say that if it went to the right, whatever it was hanging over was good or true. And if it went to the left, what it was, whatever it was hanging over was bad or false. Um, and she said to me, you know, you can't live without an object like this in your life. You, you, you must have one. And so she gave me this thing. And I felt extremely uncomfortable about it. I'm, I'm not into this kind of hocus-pocus, <laughs> occult type of stuff. Uh, so I put it away and thought, ooh, I don't want to see this thing. But she took it everywhere and she would sit there holding it also over her son, who she, who vanished, you know, was gone, who she thought was dead, who I found later on after her death, unfortunately. She would sit there holding a, the pendulum over a photograph of her dead son, who she thought was, she didn't know where he was. And she said, no, he's gone because it goes to the left. He's, he's dead. Uh, and a bad way to figure out the truth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, so w when I... When I eventually went to try to, well, to be open with my grandmother about my work and my research and what I had done, um, she uh, basically defended uh, their actions, said that the SS were the most beautiful men who walked the earth, and, and so on and so on. And in that moment, I thought of the pendulum, because I thought, I know why she needs that thing. 
She needs it because she lost her inner moral compass. And that's why I called the book The Pendulum. But I also called it The Pendulum because it's, it's also kind of representing me in the book because I'm constantly going backward and forward about whether I should keep doing this or not or am I betraying my family or not. I mean, it was hardly a journey, I think you realize from reading it, in which I was, you know, strong and determined and just, you know, went ahead and did things. I was constantly hesitating. I mean, if it hadn't been for a lot of good people with good values and a, a belief that the truth needed to come out, I wouldn't have got anywhere. And that's the reason why I see this trip as actually, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dark story, but it's also a journey into light because it's about meeting people who actually share your values and want to do something. Uh, and which is also one of the reasons that I, I, I you know, have more faith in humans now than I did before I started. Well, thank you, Julie. I now see that we have Ingrid Belander Todini with us from Brussels. So I think I'll be, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. I, I hear you really badly, so I, I couldn't hear the invitation to speak, so maybe. <laughs> so please, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Ingrid Belandre Todino. I'm, I'm the head of unit for fundamental rights policy at the European Commission here based in Brussels. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I was really happy to be able to speak about what we're doing to uh, combat anti-Semitism and uh, remembrance of the Holocaust and fostering Jewish life, which is part of, of the work that my, my unit is doing on, on fundamental rights, uh, human rights. So um, this uh, week, as you all know, is the, the remembrance, uh, the Holocaust Remembrance Day on Friday. We are marking the 78th anniversary of the liberation of the uh, concentra concentration camp of Auschwitz and Birkenau. And it's really to uh, never forget the millions of Jewish women, men and children, and also other victims, of course. There were hundreds and thousands of Roma people murdered during the Holocaust. And uh, the Commission is working really uh, hard now since um, a few years to, to uh, uh, fight uh, anti-Semitism and also act positively to uh, keep the memory of the Holocaust alive and to uh, look at the future. And we also uh, work uh, with Sweden, which has done uh, quite quite a lot of work um, in the last few years. And, and last year we had the Malmö Forum, the Remember React, that took place 20 years after the first Stockholm Forum on the Holocaust. So that is uh, work that we uh, very much welcomed. We work with the Sp uh, Swedish presidency of the IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, um, which were our, our the two main priorities is to promote uh, the progress uh, uh, of, of the commitments made in the Malmo Forum and also to enhance the IRA as an institution. And we have also worked with um, the Swedish presidency of the council this week. Uh, last night we organized a conference on remembering the past, shaping the future, where we were um, happy to receive uh, the minister uh, Polina Bramberg and the president of the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, Anne Bernes. Um, we uh, marked the Holocaust in a in a very different parts of, of, of the work, uh, apart from, from the explanation of, of these commitments made. We also had the uh, great uh, honor to listen to the story of Henriette uh, Kretz, a survivor of the Holocaust. And she told us about her childhood, moving from being uh, just an ordinary child, as she said, in Poland, Ukraine, to uh, being persecuted and having finally her parents basically killed in front of her while she was fleeing for her life 
and then she managed to escape and be saved and continue her life and she's telling this story uh, especially to young people to to keep the memory and the and the history alive of the holocaust because if you don't remember the history you can't uh, address the future so the holocaust is the defining legacy of the europe's uh, history um but it doesn't stop there we have seen a rise of uh, Holocaust denial and distortion and very old anti-Semitic uh, anti uh, conspiracy theories surging during the military invasion of uh, Ukraine and the crisis that we are now living of, of, on an energy crisis and the cost of living crisis and, and that these are the moments where these conspiracy theories come up to the surface and, and people are eager to find someone to blame. So this is something that we really need to fight for, for all of us, because Holocaust denial, distortion and trivialization is, uh, uh, we really believe, poisoning our society. Um, we have EU law on combating, uh, on actually criminalizing hate speech and hate crime based on um, a racist or anti-Semitist and uh, anti-religious um, hate speech and hate crime since 2008. But we're still seeing uh, hate crime and all these hate speech happening on very re regularly in Europe and beyond. So it's really important to keep uh, these aspects alive and keep uh, addressing them because they are part of our democracy. They are important for all, all of us. Um, it's toxic. It's a threat to all citizens, not only the Jewish people. Uh, and it's a threat to our democracies, as I said, and EU values at the end. I unfortunately didn't listen to your presentation, Julie. I would have really liked to do that because um, working in the Commission with uh, um, colleagues from, from all over Europe, I really have noted that many German colleagues uh, struggle with this situ situation. It is really extremely sensitive issues for especially German colleagues. It impacts their daily work and, it, and also it influences the work that we are working on in, in my area on, on democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights and also the rights of minorities. So in DG Justice and Consumers, where my, my unit is based, we are promoting fundamental rights. We are implementing the Charter on Fundamental Rights and we're fighting all forms of hatred and discrimination on any ground, religion, beliefs, gender, sexual orientation, age and disability. And this commission in, in the von der Leyen, uh, led under uh, Ursula von der Leyen, there has been a very, very strong push to, to uh, promote equality and fight discrimination and all forms of hate. We have presented several strategies and action plans in the past few years. We have a Roma strategic framework for equality, inclusion and participation. We have a gender equality strategy. We have the LGBTIQ equality strategy. We have the rights of uh, persons with disability, a strategy about that. And we have an action plan on integration and inclusion and the anti-racism action plan. So based also in, in line with these strategies, we presented in October 2021 uh, the Commission's first ever EU strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. This strategy includes almost 100 actions of uh, about half have uh, been set in motion and many related to Holocaust education, research and remembrance. Uh, we have made the Holocaust remembrance an EU funding priority through the, the remembrance strand of our citizens' equality, rights and values program with a dedicated budget of 10 million euro for, for this year. So that, that's for, for every year. So this year is uh, 10 million that we're using to fund projects to, uh, as I said, 
uh, are, are the objective is to to to, to have actions to, for the remembrance, but also fight the uh, conspiracy theories, the, the fake news, and so on. Um, just to give you a, a few examples, um, we are now funding a project called Active Holocaust Legacy, it's starting now in January. It's, um, the aim is to address um, complex memories and work where there might be conflicting narratives in countries such as uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Poland, Italy, Slovenia and Croatia. The, the idea is really to build and promote a comparative approach to European uh, authorities in, 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 uh, in the media and also in, in public life. We're also uh, supporting institutions promoting Holocaust remembrance and who are also working on Holocaust research and education in Sweden. And there's the Stockholm-based Padeja Institute and we also support the European Institute for Jewish Studies that is based in Sweden. Um, the next call for proposal um, is actually just fresh out. So if you look at our website, I encourage those of you who are interested to set up a project to look at the possibilities to receive commission funding for, for these types of projects. Another action that we have also just started is um, in a, a key action in the anti-Semitism strategy is to support the creation of a network of young European ambassadors to promote Holocaust remembrance, acting both on the ground and on the, in the digital sphere. Here uh, we also would like to encourage uh, young Swedes to come on board and be, uh, become young ambassadors to spread the word, remember in the past and look at the future. We are also starting to work on creating a network of sites, of physical sites where the Holocaust happened, such as hiding places, deportation places uh, and killing sites all over Europe. This is also with a purpose to really recall that this was a real um, things happening so people shouldn't forget. Finally, just to conclude, uh, there is also a campaign called Protect the Fact on countering Holocaust distortion, distortion where the Commission is working in partnership with the UN, UNESCO, ODIR and it's led by the IRA. So thank you very much for having me, uh, giving me a few moments to present the work that we are doing to fight anti-Semitism, fostering Jewish life and remember the Holocaust in the spirit of uh, fighting intolerance and discrimination. We want to ensure that every child learn about the Holocaust and the atrocities uh, that happened during this period of dark European history so that it will never happen again. I think this is more important than ever and I really thank you for, uh, for uh, giving me the space as well to present the, the work that we're doing at the EU level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Ingrid Belander Todini for being with us from Brussels. Will you stay with us or will you go to your ordinary work? No, no, I'm happy to stay. I won't stay for the drinks, obviously. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, now I think it's also time to give some space and room for the audience. Is there anyone who wanted to comment or, or on uh, the presentation by Julie or to ask some questions? Please go ahead, you were in front. I would agree that no one is born evil, not Augusto Pinochet, not Hitler, not uh, your grandfather, but I do believe that some people become evil. Maybe this is a philosophical question, but I'd be interested in your comments on that. Shall I well, you've made your point clear, yeah. but maybe <laughs> Inga Brito. Oh, okay. I would rather leave the question to Julie. I can, I can elaborate anyway on what I said. Um, I hear you. 
Uh, and um, I think at some level it's a question of semantics, but maybe not. Um, I can tell you from the perspective of somebody who had to explore these personalities, especially when they're your own family, um, it's like having blinders on, uh, like, you know, a horse that's got blinders on. Uh, if, you, uh, if you, from the outset, say, I, I know what this person did, I've heard what this person did, they're evil. Uh, it kind of shuts your mind to looking for um, who this person was. Uh, as somebody who has to research it and someone who has to write. Um, so I guess I say that from the perspective of someone who's had to write about people who are close family and try to figure out what they did, even if they weren't close family. Let's say they were just f figures in history, which I'm actually doing now. Um, if I gave a person a label and said they are this, um, then that would close my mind to a lot of things. We, we, all, we all know that all of us are very complex individuals. We can do bad things, we can do good things, we, you know. Um, and um, so I chose to, to leave that away. Uh, I learned to leave it away because otherwise it would have gotten in the way of the work. But I agree with you, and certainly there are extremely evil deeds, and we're witnessing them again. I mean, there is a new genocide going on in Europe, which I kind of wanted to ask um, Ingrid about here, because um, um, you mentioned so that it will never happen again, and yet we see a, a genocide, or what appears to be signs of a genocide taking place in Ukraine. So, to, if I'm allowed, for me the question becomes, um, you know, how do we see the Holocaust in that context? What is the, the because we're, we're, we're saying we don't want it to happen again, and yet, Genocides have happened again in the post-war period, um, and they seem to be on the way to happening again in, in Ukraine. Um, what is, the, what is the, the, the value of learning about the Holocaust in that context, uh, would you say? Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Ingrid? Yeah, I heard. There was some uh, distortion, but I, I heard. Um, I think that the, 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 the campaigning, the, the information, the, the research, all the projects that we're doing to prevent um, happening again is, is a long-term investment. But it has to happen in the uh, in the schools, in, in, the, in, in, in uh, everyday life. But it also now, when the war is going on, um, there's a, it's a big effort on investigating war crimes and really going in and supporting the Ukrainians in uh, investigating and then hopefully ultimately prosecute war crimes. So it's also addressed immediately when it, when it happens. This is unfortunately not my responsibility, so I don't know any details about that work, but my colleagues uh, have made a, a, quite a number of in initiatives very concretely to extend, for example, the um, mandate of Eurojust, which is the European body of, of uh, prosecuting crime, uh, and the EPPO, to, to work also in this area. So uh, there are two sides to this, I think. Uh, hello. Hörste? Uh -huh. Um, I'm one of those students from Paidea, even though I look as I've passed my expiring date, but I was there one year ago, no, seven, five years ago. It was a fantastic school. Uh, I would like to ask you, because uh, living in Sweden, and we speak about Holocaust, I also think it's important with anti-Semitism and think of the living Jews. And Sweden has been one of the biggest supporters for the Palestinian thing. And everybody thinks that Israel came and took Palestine. As you know, it was, the name came from Hadrian, 133 BC, because, or sorry, Anno Domini, because he wanted to remind them of the Philistines. Nevertheless, this money and the European money, and you speak about Europe, the European money we are sending are 
50% of that is going to pay for slay. That is to kill Jews in Israel. And they have school books. We have been at the Foreign Ministry of Sweden, and we know that you in UEU also are giving a lot of money to these school books, which are full of instigations of killing Jews today. So I wonder, I think it's fantastic what you say that you do against or to remember Holocaust. But I, don't you think it's important also to take care of Jews living today? We are taking care of Jews living today and, and the, the funding of the school books, I think that was uh, something in the past and it's not happening now. So from our point of view, that is not happening. Sorry, that um, is happening today. So that's not true. Okay. It's in the external action, so I, I will not be able to answer that. You can hear me. Thank you, Ingrid and Julie, for, I think, very good presentations. I think they were really, really good. And uh, on the other hand, the Nazis, wherever they went in Europe, they didn't do it alone. A lot of collaborators everywhere, not to mention France and Poland, maybe in particular. And so one would only hope that there are also some younger generations of the collaborators who would follow suit and do the same thing uh, as you have done, Julie, which I think would be very good. And then on the other hand, when we think about history, it's a subject which gets less and less significant in the school education of the young generation. I think shaping the future of Europe is taking care of the young generation so they can see the real reality of history. Because it always depends on who likes writes the history books, but it also depends on who reads them. And usually the politicians who make decisions never read history books, and that's why history doesn't repeat itself, it's people who don't read history repeat the same mistakes all the time. So my suggestion would be that in those countries where there are a lot of concentration camps that it's mandatory to visit that during the education and then the Swedish educational system, just imagine if every pupil during their time goes to Auschwitz or Dachau and it's a school trip because I think it's very well invested money but just think about it how that would be. Thank you. I wonder whether Mats, being a former member of the Swedish government, if you have any comments on the, on the uh, su uh, suggestions put forward in our discussion as to schools and, uh, and ambitions to arrange uh, journeys to Auschwitz, etc. I find these ideas very good, and I think one should certainly <coughs> sort of <coughs> give some enthusiasm to these ideas too. For example, going to Auschwitz for schools, or ordinary schools in Sweden, it's not so difficult to do. So yes, I think these are good ideas. If I can uh, just toss something in. Um, I've been um, involved quite a bit in, in Holocaust education here in Sweden and, and, and elsewhere in the United States as well. And um, I think there's, there's also a need for constant innovation uh, and, um, you know, about how, how, we, how we reach students. Of course, going to concentration camps, is, is, it's hard to, to beat that experience because it, it goes to all the senses. You see, you smell, you, 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 you read, uh, you know, it's all in front of you. But um, one of the, I, I'm actually working on a project that is very generously sponsored by the U.S. Embassy here in Sweden. Uh, it's an 18-month project where uh, I and uh, a dear friend of mine who is the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor who is also a published author and has written about her grandmother's story uh, tour together uh, to different schools. 
And um, um, so that adds a different dimension. People aren't really, students are curious uh, as to how the two of us can tour around together and not get on each other's nerves. And, and you know, it also provides these, these, these two, two different stories uh, that, that, that provide very different perspectives of, 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 uh, you know, of, a, um, of a period in history. Um, and, um, but I think one of the things that really has topped it all off and made this, we were just yesterday in front of 450 students in, in uh, Avesta and uh, in, in a high school, and um, there are some musicians uh, who have, in fact, composed a song about the pendulum. Uh, they're called Adolfson of Falk. They're old pop musicians, uh, but they decided they wanted to do something for democracy, so they, read, they had read my book and sent me a song. And I had no idea about this, uh, by the way, and was completely shocked to receive this song. Uh, and sat at my desk weeping, uh, you know, could not stop weeping after I listened to it because it was so beautiful and so moving and summarized everything I have said in this, you know, in just a song. Uh, and uh, they then wrote, uh, went on to write songs about Helena's book, which is called Et Chilo Soccer, A Kilo of Sugar, about her grandmother. And they wrote songs about the experiences of Hedy Fried and Livia Frankel, who are very famous Holocaust survivors, as you all know. Uh, and they now come with us on our trips to schools, and our presentations are also, they, they sing in between. And this, there are a number of students who, and actually a rising number of students who have issues with concentration or dyslexia or whatever else, uh, and these songs go right into them. And so instead of having to write papers, uh, in many instances they are, um, you know, composing music and songs about what they're supposed to learn. Uh, the other interesting angle, I think it's important when we're talking about education, which I also encounter. I go to schools and also community colleges, so Folkhögskola, where there is a high concentration of people uh, who have come from war-torn countries, uh, including in the Middle East. And um, as you can imagine, among them, um, sometimes there's some resistance to discussing the Holocaust. Uh, why the Holocaust? Why not other things that have happened to other populations, to us, and so on and so on. Um, and and uh, so what, what I think what has to accompany Holocaust education, what, what I and my, my friend Helena do, is to use our stories. So as they take in our stories, they use that as a, as a means, as a way to think about how they might tell the stories of their own families. What did their families go through? Uh, uh, what, what, what is their story? And, and help them to get that out. Because that's another way to get people to open their minds. When, when, when you know you're going to be listened to, you're more likely to listen. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say was that I have been also been invited to come to mosques, <laughs> which I think is an interesting uh, area to talk about uh, because I think I understand why, why, why communities around mosques have had some, some difficulties taking in the story of the Holocaust, why it's hard uh, for them. Um, there are a lot of stresses and strains on people who manage mosques about this. It's extremely sensitive. Um, but I've been invited and uh, was a very long interview was done with me and spread uh, on a newsletter to mosques, uh, Shiite mosques throughout Sweden, and they were considering to have us to come and 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 talk to some of their their youngsters. So I think um, starting to cooperate with mosques and and Muslim communities and find find ways to build bridges there is is an extremely important uh, area of, of of education development. Anyone else that would like to take the floor? Yes, please. Thank you. I would like to step back to the 1930s. And if you had met your grandparents then, what could you say to them to make them take other decisions? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with your question, you, you do, you do um, sort of re remind us that 
they were people who are living in a certain time uh, with certain very, uh, very, with, with, with certain very difficult pressures on them where it was hard to resist going with certain political forces. But um, I don't think I, th I don't think I want to go to what I would say to them. Um, um, well, if you really want to know what I would say to them, I would have, I would say um, there's another way to solve these problems. Uh, the solution that is being offered by the National Socialists are not solutions. Um, now, the question is, what other options did they have at the time? Uh, whom, whom else could they vote for? And of course, there were other parties. There were there were a host of other parties. But um, I also know that other, we all know that, that, that the other uh, options for people who also were German nationalists and conservatives were not exactly that wonderful. And, and in some ways, um, it kind of is, is a um, similarity to our time in which the, the conservatives uh, uh, in many different countries, in different democracies, don't really have good options. Uh, they don't have... Um, you know, um, now I don't. I didn't know my grandfather well enough to to know whether he was um, a person who would have gone for a better option at the time. By all accounts, he he was a fairly quick to join the Nazis and was fairly convinced by them, and also was of that kind of fanatic mindset. So I don't know if I could have convinced him of anything else. Um, but but. Um, but I think it's an interesting point your question leads to, which is the parallel to today, that um, I think conservatives everywhere in the world <laughs> need to think about coming up with more reasonable uh, political options. Otherwise, they are going to lead us down a very dangerous path, which is what they are already proceeding to do. Please. Thank you, Julie. I think uh, you've proven how, well, thank you for a fantastic presentation, but you've also proved how important it is with storytelling and how effective storytelling is to make people listen and people understand. So I'm completely convinced of the power of storytelling and you've proven it. So I want to thank you for that. And I also want to hear more about how can one how can one approach your NGO on, on storytelling? Because I think it is, it is really a very, very powerful instrument to both spread uh, knowledge and, and engage. Mm. Uh, so congratulations on that. Well, I'm it. So if You're you want to get in touch with it, you can talk to me. Uh, no, no, there, there are clearly others of us working in it, but... Um, uh, I, one of the very interesting projects, just to give you, illuminate a bit more uh, the sort of things that we've got into, uh, in the book, uh, in, in the pendulum, there is a chapter which takes place in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, and um, it's in the book because um, being in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where, where I ended up as a result of a project which was funded by the Swedish Institute to support my nonprofit to 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 do uh, to to work with different communities, uh, you know, um, Muslim and Serb communities. Uh, they, our job was to bring school children together from these different ethnic communities, which don't learn the same history uh, in their schools, uh, to actually come up with common stories. So the kids would sit around a great big sheet of paper on the floor and we would give them a theme, um, and they would have to come up with a common story and also figure out a common language because they don't have the same script. Uh, and um, I put it in the book because going to Bosnia and being there and seeing essentially the, the ruins of war, which are which for any of you who have been in Bosnia, you'll you'll remember all these the, the ruins that are all around everywhere. There were there was a, a ruin across the road from where we were doing these workshops, and um, we were actually doing the workshop in a building in which bodies had been kept cold. It was very cold in there, uh, you know, that had been exhumed, and so it was everywhere all around. But being there actually got me to think a lot about what options you have 
in the embers of war? What options do people have? Um, I mean, I was trying to reach some kind of understanding about why the silence, not only silence, but also desire to stick with untruths and things in my family. Um, and being there in Bosnia, where there's a lot of Bosnia Herzegovina, lots of untruths and fake news circulating everywhere about the country's history, I thought, yes, I understand. How do you build up a new society uh, that is truth-based in the embers of a, of, a, of a genocide like that? It's an extremely difficult task. Uh, so stories worked there and, and worked in Sweden and continues to do other things. So happy to talk to you about that. Well, we are approaching time to conclude the seminar. I wonder if there is anyone else who want, wanted to take the floor and uh, comment on, uh, on the, the seminar's conclusions and presentations so far. Well, if not, I thank you, Ingrid, from uh, Brussels, for joining us. I thank the audience for coming, and I certainly thank Julie for your beautiful storytelling and for your beautiful book, and also for your interesting explanations and your thoughts over your book, which you, you presented to us uh, now uh, to introduce this seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to thank all of you in the panel, of course, for <clears throat> helping, helping us to understand storytelling better <laughs> first, because I think it's very important the way you present every one of us what we think are the truthful things. And storytelling is extremely important in this. So I think this has heightened our, <laughs> our understanding, all of us here. And... Um, I also would like to thank the <coughs> Commission and the Europa Huset, of course, but all of you, of course, Julie, Inga Britt, and <coughs> Ingrid. And now we are being served something to eat, some sandwiches, coffee, tea, and so on. So please continue the discussion and mingle a little until you feel that you have necessi necessary reason to leave, but don't leave too early. Thank you very much again. Thank you.